October 17th, 2023, um, um, a remote virtual meeting of the ESS Standards uh, Subcommittee. Uh, we do have a lot of material to get through today, uh, and so we'll just jump right in. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the summary of the July 18th meeting, and uh, this was distributed to the group uh, in advance. So does anybody have any uh, edits or corrections to make to this uh, meeting summary? And if there are no um, edits or corrections, um, it would be appropriate for someone that is uh, on the standards committee. I know we have a lot of folks here today, but uh, the voting is done by committee members. So if you're on the standards committee, um, you uh, have the ability to make a motion and a second. So is there a motion um, relating to the standards? I have a motion from uh, Jane uh, to um, uh, to uh, uh, approve and accept the uh, the meeting summary, and uh, looks like I have a uh, second from Katie Carlson. Um, is there any further discussion? Very well. If there's not, I uh, would we'll call for a vote. All those in favor, again, members of the committee, our subcommittee, uh, please say aye or indicate in the chat pod, whatever works for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Deb. Okay, anyone else? All right, very well. Thank you so much. Uh, we will declare uh, the motion approved. Joan, thank you. I see a message coming in from Deb McDonald. I'll wait for that before proceeding. Anything else? Okay. Uh, so the next item on the agenda, uh, I'll go back up to the top and, and uh, make that view, is uh, just uh, some information about uh, the subcommittee. So we are at that time of year when we ask uh, members of the subcommittee uh, to com consider their uh, roles and uh, so if the, uh, we do follow a term of office uh, process for the subcommittees as we do for the full ESS coordinating committee, um, there are three positions that are currently set to expire at the end of this calendar year, uh, Ashton, James, and Jones. Um, and the process is uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the chair of the ESS committee or the um, which sometimes is the same as the president, um, that person has the appointing authority for uh, the standard subcommittee. Uh, and the process generally has been uh, to ask the districts to have a discussion about, uh, about who uh, wishes to represent their district on the, on the subcommittees and on the full ESS committee. And um, it's totally up to you guys. Um, there is no limitation on terms. So a person that is on the subcommittee uh, can continue on to a successive uh, term. And then um, uh, also the other thing I would point out is that technically speaking, we don't necessarily have any uh, limitations. So, you know, if a district had two people that were really interested in serving on the standards subcommittee or any of the subcommittees, um, you know, we can accommodate that. So we want to encourage participation. Um, and also any member of the association that, uh, or, or anyone else really, uh, any citizen or stakeholder group that wants to listen in on the meeting um, and uh, have an opportunity to, to observe and sometimes even comment or um, ask a question when appropriate, uh, that's okay too. Uh, so um, in any event, the, the, the basic function that we're uh, presenting to you today is officially, um, we have some terms that are expiring. Uh, and I know there may be a desire by some to change, others may wish to continue, and then it's possible for districts to have more than one representative, if you choose to do that. Um, so 
Uh, this is just informational, not asking for any action today. Um, are there any questions um, about the process or um, any questions that you have might have about uh, the nominating process, the, the appointment process, or uh, the terms, anything like that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, then we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, and I'm going to switch to discussion mode here. So if you have the ability to turn your cameras on or if you want to uh, visit, uh, this is a good time to do that. Uh, I'm going to be going through several items that um, may, may not have, uh, you know, anything to display. In other cases, in some cases, there will be something I can display and I can switch to that. So the first thing uh, that we want to report to you on uh, is that um, we have been making progress. Uh, we have uh, essentially completed the transition of all of our e-submission customer organizations over to the new search application. Uh, the legacy search application is still up and running. So if there are people that want to continue to use that for a while, uh, we have no problem with that. They can continue to do so uh, until we get to the final point where we um, decide uh, from a technical perspective to turn off uh, the legacy application. There are a few things that we need to do before we turn it off. Um, and one of those is just to give everybody ample notice about what our plans are. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, the communication has been, and uh, we're planning to turn off the legacy search application by the uh, end of this calendar year. Then um, uh, the phase that we're in right now is that we basically have an open application process. And so if you go to the Iowa Land Records website, there's a button in the upper right-hand portion of the screen. And uh, any organization or individual user that wants to gain access to the new system, uh, they can complete an online application form. And Corey and Lisa are going through uh, that process to get them uh, set up. Um, sometimes we are having uh, discussions with organizations, um, um, you know, who are trying to figure out how they want uh, their system set up. And, uh, you know, uh, the other day, uh, Lisa and I did a joint webinar with Bank Iowa uh, because they were trying to figure out what they wanted to do. And so they had a group of people, some of them were going to be searchers, some of them were going to be e-submission, and we provided a training session just for them. And, and we'll do that for any organization that uh, is interested in it. Uh, Lisa, of uh, course, couldn't be with us today because she has the day off, but is there any comments that you might want to make about uh, our transition process and uh, the process of getting organizations set up in the new search application? I think the process is going really well. There is a learning curve to using the new search site, and we're happy to assist. We've done a recorded webinar. We have another webinar next week. Um, we can certainly share that information with all of you if you want to share it with your business partners. Um, and then clearing up a little bit of, um, I don't know if it's confusion, but just sharing knowledge that I gave to Lexa this morning is, how should one of her surveyors register as an individual? Even though he doesn't, he's not a business, he is a licensed surveyor. And the difference between a business user and an individual user is that as a, as a business user, you can view up to 120 images per day. As an individual user, it's only 10. And of course, recorders always have unlimited. So if that question comes to you, and you need clarification or they need clarification, let us know. But really, it's a good time to help your people um, acclimate to the new site before the new one is the only resource they have. Yeah. But and the, I, the, and the I would say, going really well. go ahead. Sorry. I would say the transition is going really well. Very good. Uh, so we have posted a notice on the Legacy website. It's right on the main page. Uh, it may not be too elegant or pretty, but we're clearly saying, hey, 
please get your application in for the new search um, uh, system uh, because this one is going away. And just that posting alone has generated a lot of activity for both uh, Lisa and Corey. There's, there are a lot of applications coming in. And I think we're just trying to um, be good stewards, I guess is the way I would say it, to uh, give everybody an opportunity to get it done and get it done in a timely way. Uh, and then uh, we know that there will be sort of a surge uh, at, the at the point where we turn off the legacy application. That will get some people's attention as well. Those who are procrastinating, we know will hear from them. So uh, anyway, I would say in terms of our, our work with our current user base and our stakeholder organizations, uh, we have been communicating, communicating, communicating. Uh, to get everybody uh, transitioned over. And so far, it seems to be working uh, as we had hoped it would. Okay, any questions about that before I move on to uh, the next topic? I see that uh, Kristen has posted uh, links to a search FAQ and a recording of the search uh, demonstration. If you have any need to uh, reference that or share that with your staff or customers. So thank you for doing that, Kristen. Appreciate it. Um, any other questions on this topic? We'll move on. Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay, the next one, I do not have anything to display. I just want to report to you uh, that at the beginning of September, uh, Lynn County uh, started up operations of their online registration renewal system. Uh, and that has been functioning. And that means that um, the Lynn County application, which is now integrated with uh, the ESS payment uh, service, um, is working correctly. And we're providing uh, daily reports to Lynn County. I think we had a bit of a glitch the other day, but uh, Lynn County is getting the information they need to do the reconciliation. And uh, we have made a few tweaks, but the system is working as planned and expected. So um, we're very happy to, to see that. Uh, we got to give some credit to Teresa Sackett in uh, Lynn County and, and Carolyn, of course, as well at the deputies conference for uh, this milestone. It's a pretty big deal. Um, and so we're looking forward to continuing our collaboration with Lynn County. And it's going to be some, a topic that we look at over the course of the next uh, year, nine months or so, uh, to see if we can leverage that to uh, help provide service to other counties as well. Um, the next item on the agenda is also just informational, and that is the um, the e-submission API that we have been rolling out uh, for our local service provider friends. Uh, it is in uh, production, uh, it's in operation, and we're very pleased to report uh, that our first service provider is actually doing the integration with their first counties as we speak. Uh, and that service provider is Solutions. Um, they have completed their development work uh, and uh, their first few counties that are going to be using the e-submission application uh, API are uh, in process. Um, our development team is actually an active communication with uh, Allison and other members of their staff uh, to make sure everything's working okay. They have identified a couple of bugs that uh, they need to work out. Uh, that's why we didn't turn everybody on at the same time, but it is functioning and we're really, really happy to reach this milestone because um, uh, from a supportability perspective and also a security perspective for those counties and service providers that were using the LCM. We really do need to seriously retire the LCM. Uh, and if you're familiar with what that is, and it's just the original uh, integration that was done with the very first version of Iowa Land Records Eastern Mission, and that's 20 years old, uh, and it just needs to be changed. Uh, so we're in the process of doing that, and we're very proud that Solutions has done the work uh, to get this done. And we know the other service providers are working on this as well. Uh, the deadline for uh, this um, is really uh, basically September of next year. So some of the other service providers have a little bit of time yet to work on it. Um, and then the next thing I am uh, 
going to report on is that we also have a separate API that we call the County Upload API. And um, for some counties, we've been using the old LCM, and others, we had a different version of the API that some of them have been using. And it is basically the process where when you complete your recording process and you're ready to send it to Iowa Land Records, this API is what exchanges the data between your county system and the Iowa Land Records system. And we are in the process of completing uh, development on the County Upload API. Uh, we're going to be having a conference call with your local service providers uh, tomorrow uh, to give them an update on this. And um, generally speaking, um, the biggest part of this is the, is the part of accepting the data that is sent to us by county and then archiving it in the Iowa Land Records uh, database. That is the big part of this. There are a few pieces of that that have not yet been completed. We're probably going to be uh, providing the service providers with a little extra time uh, to get that done. Uh, and we'll be sharing it with that with them tomorrow. Uh, the updated target date uh, to get that implemented is likely to be December of 2024. So we'll give them a few extra months. The basic architecture, architecture is the same. Um, and these are smart people, so we expect that they'll be able to get it done. Uh, there is one aspect of this, though, uh, that I want to share with you. Uh, and I'm going to switch views here and uh, share my document again. And that is something that we distributed in an email about a month ago uh, that we want to share with you. And it relates to certain pieces of data that um, are related to data points that historically have not been transferred to our land records, but which are of interest to our stakeholder organizations. And those data points are the date of the instrument, that is the date the document has been executed, the consideration amount, which actually is two separate data points. It's a consideration amount that would be associated with the sale of property. And then there's a separate consideration amount that is associated with the mortgage, okay? Um, and to the extent that that data is available and indexed by a county, uh, that would be included in the county upload API. And before anybody panics, let me circle back and I'll explain to you how this will, will work. But there are a couple of other items that we're exploring. One of them is personal identification numbers. And uh, this has been a part of the data set for Iowa Land Records since the beginning, but has not been consistently used. And the data has not necessarily been consistently transferred to Iowa Land Records and then persisted to our database. Um, so. What we're doing here is not creating anything new, but we're providing some clarity to the service providers about how their systems should be set up to ensure that the data is um, transferred to us if it is present in the, in the county uh, database. We have a whole separate agenda item on parcel ID numbers. The only part about it that is relevant to this piece of the description is how we have it set up in our database and technically what should be done by local systems to get it transferred to our land records. And then last but not least, um, I don't know if this is the right way to label it, but one of the things that uh, the surveyors group has really expressed an interest in is being able to search uh, platted land using an, an unplatted data element like section number. And um, in reviewing this, we discerned that um, the PREA uh, data structure, which we still use, and our land record data structure does include some unplatted data elements in the platted data structure. And specifically, the, the section number is included. Uh, and if we were to do something different with that, such as um, persist data, 
uh, that we receive from the county, then it would be possible for uh, surveyors and other customers to search for a property in a platted land, piece of platted land uh, using an unplatted data element life section. Um, we are exploring this idea. This is not a specific proposal. Um, we have a discussion going on right now with the surveyors organization about whether or not this would really solve their question or not. We don't know the answer to that yet, but we are beginning to have a conversation with the local service providers about is this data element in your local indexing system? How, how are you organizing it? And if you do have it, you know, how should it be mapped so that any data that's there would get into our land records? So this is this whole set of questions isn't uh, about uh, requiring um, anybody to uh, to index something in a particular way or uh, to start doing it if they if they aren't doing it. That's a separate policy question. The only thing we're really talking about here is making sure that we have a conversation with all of the local service providers to say, if we go down this road, um, you know, are, are we doing it the right way? Are we mapping it correctly to your local system? Uh, are, we, uh, uh, are we pointing things in the right place? A place so that the data would get transferred successfully if it was present. And and so if you were to go and look at our new search application, uh, you might often see in uh, most counties, I would venture to say, that there is a, a label there that in the search results that indicates something for instrument date, but there may not be any data associated with it. That's just one example. Um, so um, uh, again, I, I, I don't want anybody to overinterpret this. There are some policy issues that still need to be discussed, um, but this discussion is primarily with your local service providers. I would consider it to be a technical uh, discussion, not a policy discussion of whether any data element should be required or whether any data element is required to be indexed. Um, that, that's a separate conversation. But it is being talked about. And, uh, and so, for example, the, the thing that uh, when, we, when we first posted this, one of the main comments that we back, got back from uh, recorders, and I would have to give Travis Chase some uh, primary credit for this, is that you know, he pointed out to us and made sure we understood that, you know, not every document is going to have each of these data elements. So, you know, you can't require it. And in the sense that, um, you know, if you're writing a technical system and you're saying this element is required, what that means in the context of a database is that if it's not present, then there's going to be an error. That is different than... Um, than uh, saying that, you know, you have to index this information. So basically what we're going to be doing is saying, hey, if the data is present, make sure it gets mapped to the right place and uh, make sure it's in the right format. Uh, and then we will persist it to the database and then we'll share it with the, uh, the, the viewer, the customer. Uh, but it does not mean that it's suddenly a mandate that everybody has to do it. Uh, this is really a technical issue. So I've tried to explain that as best I could, um, but um, if there are any questions about it, um, you know, I'd be happy to happy to discuss it uh, before we move on. I'm going to switch back to uh, discussion mode now. Okay. Any any comments? I'm looking in the chat pod also to see if there are any comments about that. Uh, nothing so far. Did I explain it adequately? You know, are there any other observations or questions that you would like to share before we move on? Okay. 
Well, please don't hold back. Um, if you have comments after the meeting, uh, um, please uh, re review this, give it some consideration. Um, we're going to be, again, talking to your service providers about this in our call tomorrow, and we'll see what kind of issues or roadblocks we run into and, and report back to you later. Um, uh, going back to the agenda, I'm going to keep it where I'm at at this point, but I uh, just want to uh, touch on um, uh, three other topics and then we'll move on to the policies and procedures. Um, the first is uh, we are uh, in a situation now where um, our uh, firewalls are not working correctly. We've had uh, Cisco firewalls, um, and basically this is the device that uh, kind of keeps the bad guys out. And the way, um, not going to get into the technical issues of firewalls, but right now our firewall system is not working as it should. We do have a firewall in place, uh, but unfortunately we do not have a backup in place um, because of... Um, I guess I'm just going to say supply chain issues uh, with, with Cisco. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, if if our firewall, our primary firewall, were to go down right now, uh, our system would not be accessible. It doesn't mean that we would be attacked. It doesn't mean that the system is down, but the system would not be accessible because we just aren't going to let anybody into it, you know, without going through a firewall. Um, and so this is a, not having a failover to a secondary firewall is a, a serious operational concern. Uh, serious enough that we have uh, accelerated some of our planning around the idea of moving uh, to the cloud um, and being in a managed or hosted system, uh, not, not a hosted system in the sense of uh, a... a, a a, a software provider, but a hosted system like a data center that is uh, capable of basically operating the equipment um, that your system runs on. Uh, and um, and so we have been uh, working with LightEdge uh, our, as our data center in Altoona for many years now. Uh, they do a very good job. And so we are uh, uh, planning uh, to switch from our Cisco firewall to a FortiGate firewall uh, and take our first steps into the cloud, so to speak. Um, those discussions are underway right now. Uh, I do intend to uh, take action to um, authorize the, uh, the transition of the firewall. We're going to be switching from Cisco devices to FortiGate uh, devices. Um, and the important part of this from your perspective as the standard subcommittee is this is our first step into the cloud. As we look ahead to the next year, we're looking at um, um, reaching the end of life for most of our servers and our uh, storage equipment. Uh, we are already doing our backup in the cloud with Amazon Web Services, and that is likely to continue. Uh, but uh, we need to do something about our firewall. Uh, so I just want to inform and advise you that that is a change that's underway. Um, changing the firewall uh, structure does not necessarily commit us to change everything uh, to a, uh, a cloud environment. But uh, and quite honestly, um, that's probably the direction that we're going to be going. And I want to make sure that you're informed that we're beginning to take that journey and we'll see where it goes. And we'll have more to report to you uh, as we go forward. Uh, the next topic I want to just quickly report on is uh, that um, after we uh, finish development work on the um, on the county upload API that I mentioned just a few minutes ago, uh, one of the next biggest priorities is to update our external submitter API. And this is the API that the big national e-submission companies connect to, uh, but also we have some local uh, local organizations that connect through this API as well, including now the Department of Revenue. Um, this has been a long time coming, but uh, we're looking to 
uh, transition and the external submitter API. And we're uh, looking at uh, making some uh, requirements um, applicable to them, such as uh, we intend to have discussions with them that would lead to requiring uh, simple file and, and uh, CSC e-recording partners, the Department of Revenue, um, that going forward, if a document is declined, um, then we expect them to um, uh, process and return the document within the same package instead of uh, abandoning it. Uh, we are also going to be discussing with them uh, changes that would have them uh, present to us information about their customer so that if you are looking at a document and you need to communicate with the individual or the organization that prepared or submitted the document, uh, that you know who to communicate with. Um, and today it's kind of a black box and I would say a very common uh, suggestion, I'll put it that way, is that we wish we could um, actually you know, uh, know uh, when a document came back to us after we declined it, because it's pretty hard to tell when it comes back in a brand new uh, package and, you know, our members are just not built to do that. So um, that is something that is, I think, for 2024, uh, for our technical team, that's a very high priority. Uh, the third and last uh, uh, of these items that I want to just give you an update on and I might want to entertain a little conversation about is to change uh, the methodology that we use to process documents for PII and uh, the redaction process that we use. There are two things going on that um, uh, relate to this. One of them is the budget. Uh, some of you may have heard this, and some of you may be on the finance subcommittee, uh, but our budget is really tight, um, uh, extraordinarily. Uh, and it primarily has to do with the decline in the, in the housing market and the mortgage market. Um, you know, we just are, are affected in terms of our revenue by how much uh, activity is not happening. And we know all of you are too. Uh, so this is sort of... Uh, putting us in a position where we need to uh, revisit uh, conventional wisdom in some cases um, and see if we can find a better way to do it that maybe will uh, still allow us to provide the security that people want, uh, but maybe do it in a less expensive way. And one of the things that we're looking at is to uh, change our API with our uh, uh, redaction service provider so that we aren't sending them every single document. Uh, there are certain document types like a, a, a survey, for example, that typically, uh, if not never, um, can include PII. Uh, we really don't discriminate. We, we've kind of taken comfort to say, and hey, I want you to know we send every document through this process. Do we need to? I, I'm not so sure. Um, and especially in this day and age where we don't see as much PII coming through in documents as we used to. Uh, so we're going to be taking a hard look at making a change in our process so that if a document is of a particular document type, maybe it doesn't get automatically sent uh, to CSI uh, for redaction. Maybe we just let it go through. Um, if anybody finds something, we still have the systems in place to immediately remove it from public access and to send it through the redaction process. Uh, but do we really have to do everything? Um, and so, you know, that is a piece of information I would share with you and I would welcome any, any comments that you have. While you're thinking about that, uh, the uh, other aspect of this is that uh, we know that CSI, who has been our service provider really since 2009 for these redaction activities, um, was recently acquired by Tyler Technologies. Um, and we are very uncertain about what that means for our system. Um, it, we're uncertain about what it means for our costs. You know, are they going to increase our prices? Um, and are they going to be the same company to work with that we've 
I had a great relationship with over a number of years, but um, does this chain rep represent something that we need to consider alternatives? So uh, there are a couple of things that work right now relating to our redaction process that, that we are exploring. Um, I'm not asking for any decisions today, um, but with this information, if anybody had any comments or questions, I uh, would be happy to address those at this time. And please feel free to enter a comment or question in the chat pod if you wish. Any questions? Okay, I uh, uh, am going to move on to the meteor topics now. Uh, so in doing so, I'm going. I am going to switch views back to the sharing mode for a little bit uh, and uh, get back to. Uh, sharing um, the uh, uh, the materials. And the next item on the agenda is an update to the terms of use. And this is something I want to share with you on screen uh, and explain each of the elements as we go forward. Uh, I would introduce the issues relating to uh, the amendment to the terms of service uh, to be primarily technical and corrective. Uh, nothing really substantive here in terms of the rules of the game, but there are some, you know, after we got through the last meeting and we went through the ESS coordinating committee meeting um, and um, went through to, you know, to publish the updated terms of service, um, you know, we just identified a few things that probably should be fixed. Um, and that's what I'm bringing to you today. Um, so some of them are going to, uh, ask yourself, why didn't we change this way back when? Uh, and that would be a legitimate uh, question. Uh, but uh, this is what happens when you reread some things. Um, and uh, so the first set uh, that I should have on screen, and uh, Lisa um, or any, any member of the team, if, if you don't see what I'm talking about, please let me know. Uh, but the first item really is a, um, a language issue. Um, I'm not sure that it would be current uh, to use the term he, she anymore. And so instead of uh, using that reference uh, to use the term or the phrase, they agree. So now the first paragraph would read, each registered organization and user represents and warrants that they agree that the user identification and authentication procedures and so on and so forth. And the same thing is uh, proposed for paragraph six. So it's just a updating the language. It's not really a policy change. Um, the next item in section two, um, you know, when we talk about some uh, legacy language that has been around for a long time. We are starting now to make um, distinctions between um, um, electronic and, and physical documents. And um, as we read through this, it just seemed, you know, when we're talking about equivalency uh, and the U.S. mail, obviously that is a physical document. Uh, so we're just attempting to add some clarity here to, to say that, you know, whatever goes to the mail is a physical document. Uh, not an electronic document. Okay, uh, the next item in section three relates to uh, the uh, uh, validation procedure. So in the uh, update that we adapted, uh, that you adapted uh, uh, recently, we included a provision that said that uh, ESS reserves the right to verify and validate the information provided by an organization use or user on the application form. Um, as we have gone through the application processes and have had discussions about applications that we've received, uh, that quite honestly, we have doubts about the authenticity of the people that are uh, submitting applications or whether or not uh, the address information or other information they're providing to us is accurate. We asked ourselves, okay, what should we do uh, to verify or validate, you know, so that we aren't just uh, making an arbitrary decision to not create an account for someone. Uh, 
our policies do say that the information you submit has to be accurate and how do we validate that and one thing that we've seen others do uh, and uh, that um, uh, we would propose that we uh, mirror is the idea of asking people to provide us uh, with their uh, IDs, either a real ID uh, or a password. And I want to emphasize the language says verification may include a review of government issued identification documents, such as a passport or a real ID. So if for whatever reason they don't have one of those two things, there are other alternatives that uh, could be explored. But basically, we feel it's important to um, maybe provide some more direct notice that we're going to ask you to produce evidence of who you are, um, particularly if you're an individual. But, you know, there are some cases that might be an organization also. So uh, this is this is uh, maybe I would say the most substantive uh, policy change uh, that we're proposing. But it really is a clarification uh, of how we're going to ask for verification, um, not whether we're going to ask for verification. Uh, I'm going to keep on, I'm going to get through all of this and then we can uh, have a conversation and a discussion. Uh, the change in uh, section 7.8.1 uh, uh, really relates to uh, just taming, um, changing terminology to be more consistent with the rest of the policy. So we're using the term ESS instead of our language in that uh, section. And the next section, again, I'm going to say it looks like it's a change, but it really isn't. Uh, as we read through uh, section 7.9, uh, the update that was adapted uh, by the ESS committee in August, um, uh, we just realized that we overlooked providing us more specific information about um, uh, what happens with an individual. Uh, and how 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 do the individual how would the individual uh, be affected? And uh, we we realized that you know we needed to include some more specific language. So um, we were very clear in terms of how an organization with 120 document per day per organization user limit worked, but we really didn't say anything about. Um, individuals and it was um, vague and unclear. And so um, we felt that it would be appropriate. There are going to be circumstances where maybe an individual is doing a little bit more family research at a particular period of time and it would not be uh, inappropriate for them to say, hey, can you give me more than 10 a day because I'm doing this and then for a limited period of time letting them do that. Uh, and so um, this language is intended to uh, permit that uh, to happen. And the changes in uh, 7.91 and 7.92 both relate to uh, that as well. And so those are the uh, policy uh, changes and technical adjustments that we're suggesting uh, for uh, Chapter 7. Uh, I would be happy to answer any uh, questions. And, I'll switch back to our discussion mode for any uh, comments you may have. Feel free to put yourself on camera and or and uh, join a conversation or uh, any enter any comments or questions into the chat pod. Any questions or edits or changes that you wish to suggest. Thank you, Ashton, for being brave and getting on camera. <laughs> any any questions or comments? Um, I reluctant to, I'm reluctant to cut off any conversation, but uh, would someone wish to make a motion then? If you are on the same description. Does anybody, anybody on this committee wish to make a motion?
Jolyn has moved. Okay, Ashton has moved and Jolyn has seconded. Uh, thank you, Deb. Uh, we'll keep your session in reserve for a future one. Uh, so jump in um, later. Um, is there any further discussion? If not, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please say aye or enter an aye or a vote in the chat pod. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashton, Jane. Okay. Are there any opposed? Um, please uh, uh, signify by saying nay or entering that in the chat pod. Uh, thank you, Joan. Hearing no uh, opposition, I will declare the motion to be approved and we will move on to the next, uh, next topic. So I'm gonna switch back to sharing mode now. And uh, we're going to uh, go back to uh, the, the packet of materials. And um, I am uh, going to talk a little bit now about associated documents. So as you may recall, and again, uh, team members, if you feel like I'm not displaying the right thing, let me know. Uh, but what you should see on the screen now is a um, updated version of an amendment to chapter three relating to uh, associated documents. And um, the history of this is that uh, we did bring this to you at your July meeting, and uh, it was approved by the standards subcommittee uh, as presented at that time. And then we took that to the full ESS coordinating committee at their meeting in August. And there was a very healthy discussion, uh, good conversation, and um, uh, the uh, uh, the conversation uh, really centered around uh, the use of the term shall, okay? So for your benefit, uh, what I've done is I've color-coded a few things. And the color coding, mostly if it's in yellow, it relates to the use of the term shall. And uh, I'm looking to uh, members of the coordinating committee that may be with us today, um, thinking uh, specifically about Nancy if she's on um, to participate in this. But a concern was expressed that the use of the term shall uh, might be interpreted uh, by recorders to say that this information was required um, uh, and that it would be potentially a reason for uh, increased document rejection, which uh, was was not the intent. There was never any intent uh, to say that, you know, if uh, a document submitted didn't have associated reference information, that it has to be declined. In some cases, it probably should be, um, such as an example, if somebody submits a satisfaction of mortgage, um, and they don't include the reference to the original mortgage, that might be a technical issue that uh, is raised with the submitter to say, hey, you're missing some information here. Um, doesn't even have to be, you know, sort of, uh, oh, that was just, you know, whatever you would say, dumb or, you know, not appropriate. Um, uh, but you might, you might reject a document. You might declare a document if there is information missing like an associated reference. But to say, to use the term shall in this policy, some felt that it could be interpreted as a mandate uh, and a reason for rejecting the document, even if, if it might not be necessary. Uh, that, that was the main thrust of the, of the discussion. So not for any other reason than just to call out that, yes, in fact, the term shall is used numerous times uh, throughout the policy. Uh, but the shall really is intended to say, if it is there, it should be indexed. That's really what the shall is. It doesn't, it's not imposing a mandate on the submitter. It really is uh, a mandate that, hey, we're gonna start indexing this consistently. That is what we were talking about from the very beginning. So, um, a couple of things that I want to also highlight. So in green, 
um, a very key phrase in 3.9 sub 2 as we presented it to you in um, July is this phrase, if the reference is present. So the basic core policy says, each county shall include in its electronic index an associated document reference to an antecedent document if the re reference is present in a document when submitted for recording, okay? So um, that really is the operative phrase. We, we had accepted the idea that we want to encourage uh, submitters to include associated reference information when they were submitting documents. And that really is universally true, um, except for a couple of situations. One situation would be that if there is a, um, a, um, a groundwater hazard statement that is submitted concurrently, well, the submitter doesn't know what uh, index reference you assign. So you really shouldn't be declining it in that case. And then um, there are going to be situations where um, maybe they don't know um, the um, uh, the original deed reference, um, even though you want it to be included there. Um, you know, that isn't necessarily always going to be the case. So um, in most cases, you want you want the, the submitter to include the reference information. Uh, but uh, to provide that sort of um, safety valve uh, so that you can record a document uh, without rejecting it, that's why that reference to if the reference is present uh, is incorporated there. Uh, we did hear some beeps. Uh, Lisa's pointing out, can everybody still hear us okay? Okay, thank you, Jane, for that confirmation. So with that background in mind, then um, uh, let's look at um, uh, the language that's been added in blue. So everything that you're seeing in blue is something new that we're, uh, that we've added from the earlier version. And basically, um, uh, uh, we're saying that, um, you know, that the index information uh, should be included as an associated reference. Uh, so that we're not saying that uh, that it you know shall be there, but it really um, is intended to kind of emphasize that what we're if there's a mandate here, it's to include information in the index for associated reference, not to necessarily um, you know mandate that the submitter uh, had to do it that way. We do have some language in a in a code section that we'll talk about later that might get into the submitter mandate. Um, but what we're really trying to say is, if there's a mandate here, it is to it is to um, uh, mandate uh, the use of associated references in these particular uh, cases. So. Um, uh, I may be going to direct a question back to um, uh, Nancy or uh, Joe Lynn, uh, a member of the ESS uh, committee that uh, is present today. Um, she says, we haven't had a chance to talk about this with the full coordinating committee. We're going through standards first. But since we have some folks here, I would pose this question uh, to you. You know, due to the changes um, that are represented here, particularly the use of the term, the index information for A, uh, does that help clarify uh, the question for you? Or did I miss the point altogether? What are your thoughts? I'm going to switch back to discussion mode. comments from Nancy, Jolyn, um, or anyone else? Um, do you feel like um, the modifications do add some clarity to this question about what's being mandated? 
or is there any other issue that you want to revisit? Nancy's entered a comment in the chat pod. That language looks okay to me. Okay. Boy, if I did something right, it's an amazing day. <laughs> Other comments? Okay, Phil, before, Phil, yeah, if, go ahead. If you, ahead. if you could go back to, I think it's um, B and the associated reference, it states, you, you put in, in quotation deed of trust and you had a question mark about that. Yes, and I'm going to get to that next. Okay. Um, but uh, thank you, Census. That's absolutely right on point. Uh, uh, Joe Lynn has added the comment. I think you did a good job explaining it, and I'm okay with the language too. Okay. So I think we've resolved the question about the mandate with the addition of the language. Um, and I, I hope it's clear that in this document, which is a policy, not a Iowa statute, we're just saying going forward, uh, we're going to index associated references in these situations that these are things that we've identified are of interest to users uh and we're going to do the associated reference indexing with the understanding uh that uh, uh that uh, we want the information to be present in the document whenever possible it may not always be possible such as the case of a a groundwater hazard statement or um, something. But in, mo in most cases, if somebody is interested in associated reference, they probably should be incorporating it in the document they're submitting for recording. And I think in most cases, that's a reasonable um, expectation. Um, so uh, then uh, last but not least, I just wanted to raise a question uh, so this is not a recommendation or anything, but um, uh, one of the things that uh, kind of um, cropped up in some related discussions is, um, uh, and it actually um, had to do when we were talking about um, uh, instrument dates, um, you know, said, well, uh, one of one of the pieces of input we got is well, you know, in certain documents we we don't get an instrument date, you know, and um, uh, in in other cases, you know, there were there differences in how uh, things were indexed locally, and one of the things that was observed is um, that a deed of trust is very much like a mortgage, um, and uh, it just caused me to. Uh, say out loud, gee, um, should there be uh, associated references for deed of trust if they're like a mortgage? And is there any uh, related document to a deed of trust that should have an associated reference? And so this um, this is the uh, question I'm asking you. Uh, so I'm not making a recommendation. It's just as a question that occurred to, to us um, to say, you know, should we be doing something with deed of trust? And if the answer is no, that's Phil. You don't know, understand. We can remove it, but I did want to just ask the question, and then I will come back to Anne's uh, comment. So not hearing anything, what I'm going to interpret this as, nobody's really jumping up and saying, hey, we should do something with you to trust. Um, thank you for indulging me. I appreciate um, um, uh, the question. Um, I see a comment now from Sherry saying, yes, the deed of trust could have a release. Um, does that happen very often or uh, rare? Yes.
So, um, you know, would not be that difficult to add a paragraph here saying uh, deed of trust and release of deed of trust using the same language, but <laughs> kind of addressing um, um, I, I'm, here's what I'm going to say at this point, and that is that uh, I, rather than uh, slow things down, uh, let's remove the deed of trust from the discussion. That's something that we might want to visit uh, at a later point in time. And I do think that um, um, the question that Ashton has raised in the chat pod is a, is a fair one because um, if you index a deed of trust as a mortgage, you, it, and and we all see that done, um, or that not everybody does it the same way, uh, that that might be a policy thing that we review. And one of the main things that comes to my mind is that deed of trust is one of the document types in the PREA list that we have used since the beginning. And so, and it is a searchable element. So if we index a deed of trust as a mortgage, it means that anybody who searches for deed of trust in our database may not be able to find it if that is a search criteria because it wasn't indexed that way. It was indexed as a mortgage. And I, and I think that maybe is something that we can talk about. Um, so, Rather than try and solve that issue today, I would I would defer on that and uh, ask you to consider the policy as presented without that item. And then uh, I, I need to get back to Anne's comment. Let me scroll back up. Uh, so Anne's question is, do I understand it correctly? We used to call it over-indexing, but now we really want it to be the standard. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I can speak to what is or is not over indexing, but my answer would be yes, this would represent the standard, the expectation in every county that if there is a certain, any of these instances, these enumerated instances occurred, and in most cases, if the, if the information is present, then that associated reference um, should be indexed. And I'm part of where I'm coming from uh, is associated references, from my view, are one of the most popular, useful parts of the new search application from what we hear. Um, and um, if, we could, if we could do it more consistently and consistently, um, I think I think it would be very much appreciated by the customers. Um, so my answer to you, Anne, is I don't know if it's over indexing. It's just indexing. And these are the enumerated circumstances where indexing of an associated reference would be expected as a requirement for everybody. And I've got some additional comments. Um, uh, Nancy said, we index any reference in the document, um, even if it's the legal description, we figure it helps the abstractors. Same here uh, from Joan, I don't consider it over indexing. And Anne's comment is, we do index them here, but it has been discussed that when a survey is listed in a mortgage legal, that only the legal is noted in some offices. Um, I would say the way that this has been constructed is that the policy would not require, um, not require you to uh, index uh, a, um, a survey to a mortgage uh, that is an associated reference. Um, 
the surveyors were much communicated with them have been more focused on the the uh, the chain of history among survey documents, not necessarily with other recorded documents. So, I I would say um, I would say that is not intended in this policy the way it's written. Um, only between surveys or similar documents, not with other recorded documents. I'm not saying that's a bad idea, and I'm not saying maybe if the reference is there uh, to go ahead and include the associated reference, um, but it's not intended to be required by this policy. I appreciate the comments. Um, um, uh, I would, what I would suggest is if we, if we wanted to go further to include a reference to a survey that appears in a legal description of another document that's not a survey related document, uh, happy to, happy to review that, uh, but, uh, not necessarily required at this time. It would be what my suggestion would be. You as a subcommittee, um, you have the authority to make motions to amend. Um, and if anybody wishes to do so, um, now would be the time. And if not, Uh, Jane, Jane made the comment, sometimes the document refers to old surveys that are not recorded or imaged. And so there, if, if there is no recorded reference because they weren't recorded, it's a little hard to, hard to um, uh, include an associated reference. <clears throat> Maybe they do need to be recorded, even though <laughs> they're old. Uh, but uh, that's not where we want to go today. I, I think that there is a... Um, oh, so they're recorded, but they're not indexed yet. Well, again, if they're if they're not in your electronic index, or if they are not there, um, we're not asking you to go. We're not suggesting that you add associated references to things that you have not indexed. Um, maybe maybe you could. Um, I would say that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. And very, maybe a very useful idea, but not not what we're talking about here. I'm gonna save this conversation for uh, future discussion, both with you and the surveyors. This has been very good. Okay, so if somebody were to make a motion, the motion would be to approve and recommend the adoption of this updated associated reference policy, indexing policy, um, excluding any reference to deed of trust. That was just a question. Do you wish to proceed? Okay, thank you, Joan. Joan has moved the approval of this updated version of the associated reference policy um, is there a second? Jane has seconded. Any further discussion? Mm. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Or enter it in the uh, chat pod. Very well. Are, are there any opposed? And if you would say nay or enter nay in the chat pod if you're opposed. See no opposition. We'll declare the motion approved, and uh, we're going to move on to the next uh, potential action item. Uh, so I'm going to stop uh, uh, the uh, discussion pod, and we're going to switch back to um, the sharing pod. And I'm looking at page 16 of the um, of the uh, of the document, and. Uh, this relates to parcel identification numbers. We have talked about this. Um, I guess, you know, if you want to go back and look at it, we uh, originally adopted a policy, you adopted a policy back in 
2013. It was amended in 2015. I guess it's sort of a, a white flag action uh, to say that, um, um, you know, we wanted, we encouraged it. And if you look at the language and um, the, the first part of uh, 3.10 subsection 2, um, you know, it said when practicable. Uh, that when practicable was added back in 2015. And that was because um, I think, honestly, um, it just was not a strong consensus and was not widely uh, adopted. So <clears throat> what's, what is uh, on the table here today is to revisit this um, and to say that we're going to ask every county even if you're doing it now, great. If you're not, if you're not doing it, it would become a requirement day forward, not going back in time, that everybody would index uh, personal identification number in their uh, electronic index, um, and um, and that it would be transferred to our land records so it could be uh, displayed um, in a search result. Um, as a part of the uh, as a part of the database, um, so the very first part um, uh, is just a kind of the statement of purpose uh, that the idea of using partial identification numbers is because it's a data element that can be tied to other data in assessors' offices, in uh, external databases like uh, the Beacon system. Um, that's why we're really talking about this. And then 3.10 sub 2 removes the qualification when, when practicable and would make it a, a requirement that every county begin doing this day forward. Um, and, um, and we needed to address the idea of um, what happens uh, in the case of a subdivision or maybe reverse a consolidation that is a, results in a change in the parcel ID number. Um, I think when we previously discussed this, there was a pretty strong sentiment to say, um, hey, I will index it if it's present in the document. If you give me a conveyance document and you refer to a previously recorded document. I will enter this. I will enter um, the uh, partial ID number um, if it's present in that document. And so, it kind of is that associated reference number. Um, but the the problem with that, as we think about it, is that it is difficult to. Um, um, to always expect that the submitter is going to be understanding what that will be because it may occur after the document gets recorded. And the specific circumstances would be um, that, um, you know, the postal ID number may, as it's reconstructed, may not be known until it's changed by the uh, the assessor's office and or the auditor's office. Um, and so that may not be a realistic expectation. So uh, a modified version of the language that is underlined in subsection 3.102 would say, if the parcel identification numbers remain unchanged as a result of a transaction, it shall be added to the appropriate document index within five business days after the recording day. So in other words, it may be, um, it may be that um, nothing changes. And in that case, the submitter could, or preparer could include um, the partial ID number in the document. But if the partial ID number is modified, then that should be included as well. But maybe you need to allow a little more time to include that or to find that 
um, not as a research back in your index, but to set up a procedure where changes in partial ID numbers associated with transactions would be information that is exchanged within the county. And then, then that would be the partial ID number that would be entered in the record, record recorder's index um, that um, uh, would reflect what the, the current partial ID number is. Okay, and really, um, that's that's what we're that we're trying to do, um, and we're also just reemphasizing that <clears throat> as time goes forward and things do change, to be clear that there's no expectation that you go back in your index and update it. It was intended to be a historical reference at the time that document was recorded. Um, and and we tried to be clear on that. And then uh, just to specify a little bit of additional time to get ready for this, um, the suggestion to say actually make the mandatory part of this effective, not this January, but in January 2025. That's a debatable point, but um, the draft that's presented to you would not make this fully effective until 2025. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and we'll get to the discussion. <laughs> Tell me what you think. And I'm expecting Sue Myers to jump in here <laughs> too. Because okay. she served at she served on the pre uh, task force on this, so go ahead, Sue. So can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So last week we had another of our pre work group things, um, and those of us on the phone call have the, the white paper is going to reflect that this number shall be referenced in the land records management system. So that's what... The, our work group has agreed to and changed the language to. And as one of the people in my work group said, this is part of the three-legged stool, the address, the PIN number, and the legal description. So there you have it in a nutshell, folks. Um, I'm, I'm all for it, getting it in the index. The more we can do, the more we can do. Mm -hmm. And we have to start stepping up to the plate. <laughs> We just started putting it in PAINs last week, so it's going really good. I have a question. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, yes, yes you said so. Bill, when you talk to the service providers, is that something that you can just mention to them that maybe there's a give and take, you know, um, sharing of the information within our county um, program? Um, if we use the same, you know, like Tyler Technologies, we push information to the auditor. Is there a way that it can get pushed back? You know, when they enter parcel ID numbers, can it get pushed back somehow? Or um, I don't know. It's just something that, you know, um, if it's been getting entered correctly by another office, is there a way that that can dump back into or there's a way that we can pull it in? But that's just me thinking outside the box a little bit. Yeah, uh, actually, you're not that too far out of the box at all. It, uh, it does uh, it does happen that way. Yes, we have talked to the service providers about it on multiple occasions, and and they they know this is coming. Uh, they know we've been talking about it a while, and and I and at tomorrow's conference call, we're going to be talking to them again. The main feedback that we get from that we received from the service providers. Somehow there was a miscommunication or whatever, but in the beginning they got the impression that uh, maybe it wasn't required, and so they didn't do it. But they have expressed to us that they, if they, particularly if they serve another office in the county, that they do have the ability uh, to provide that information. But for whatever reason, over these many years, they just haven't sent it to us and, and so that we can persist it in our database. And now that we're having this conversation, I think generally 
uh, I, I really haven't received any uh, policy or technical resistance from uh, the service providers. There may be some changes that they have to make, uh, but um, but but generally, generally what I hear from uh, the service providers is if the recorders ask us to do it, we'll do it. Uh, we won't take your word for it, Phil, but if they tell us that they want to do it, um, we'll do it. So that's kind of the, the feedback that I get. Uh, let me scroll through uh, just a couple of the comments here. Um, um, uh, so yes, I think some other people are affirming your idea. Uh, I know it's being done in some places. Um, and has said, are the pins coming in on the deeds in the legal description? And that's what you're indexing or are you going out and grabbing it after the fact? Um, uh, my, my answer to you would be going forward that there would be communication and that we encourage submitters to include the PIN when they're submitting the document for recording. And that particularly in cases if uh, it uh, is not changing, it's just the same parcel being transferred from part A to part B, um, it should be in the it should be in the document, okay. But then uh, the difference is what happens if uh, property is conveyed and then uh, the other office in the county has to change the postal ID number because of a subdivision or whatever action. Um, the kind of the research part of it, in my mind, is to have the communication systems in place so they are informing you of changes that they're making making in the postal ID numbers associated with particular transactions so that you can do that. Or as Stacy has suggested, that if the system is talking to each other, that they set it up so that they provide that to you um, for action in, in your index. So the idea is definitely we're not trying to create a research job. Um, in most cases, when property is conveyed and there's no change in postal ID numbers, what we would be saying is submitters, you need to be including that in the documents that you're submitting. Uh, but there are going to be those cases where things change and other other systems have to be in place uh, to facilitate that, that exchange. Joan added the comment, we have our auditor's real estate department and our pins for conveyances in our index now. This has been happening for almost 20 years here. So in this case, if I understand what you just said, uh, Joan, you're actually providing a, a means for your fellow office holders to enter the data for you. Um, and, you know, that that would be ideal, right? Not everybody may be able to do that, but, uh, you know, some sort of exchange of information uh, between offices does make sense. Uh, Anne has added, I'm just going to, uh, Stacey, I've asked Eagle about that process, and the response was it would likely be a development fee to create a pull of the pin into our EULA system. Um, and Sherry laughed. Uh, and then uh, Teresa says, we just enter postal ID numbers for transfer conveyances. Currently, we do a postal search each using, search using Tyler version 10 and export them in Excel. However, if a postal number is on a mortgage or whatever, we don't put them in. On split, the auditor lets us know what the new postal is, and we enter it in our index at a later date. Uh, my a question to you, Teresa, would be, you know, uh, try to make our best estimate, but is 20 business days usually enough to do that uh, indexing at a later date? Did we get that right, or does it need to be different than that? I saw Stacey to shake her head a little bit on that. Um, I think 20 days should be a sufficient. You think it would be? Stacey, add your comment. <laughs> I'm not hearing you. You've got, you're muted. Okay, there we go. So like a subdivision plat, um, our, um, the assessor has to assign what year it's for. So that may take a while depending on where it is in the process like for tax um, when taxes are being run I know every county is different but there is a time that they hold and don't process the new subdivisions 
as they've already rolled it down to the treasurer, the auditor's office has. So that's the 20 days may not be sufficient in some situations where there's new subdivisions with new parcel numbers. And, and there may be times where a plat may also have you know, 15, 20, 30 sub or parcel numbers as well. That's kind of where I don't know if there's a way that you could, if there's more than only you only have one space in your index indexing for a parcel ID number, how do we let the people know that are searching it that there's more? You know, maybe Joan has with COT, they maybe have, you know, unlimited parcel ID numbers that they can enter, but I think some some county um, counties may only have one or two places to put parcel ID numbers. So okay. that's something that we have to think about too, or maybe you guys already have. Um, should the language say something like, I mean, we've got a couple of options here in this uh, 310 subsection two, we could extend it to 30 days. We could change the number there. Uh, we could be more general and say, shall be added a, uh, to the appropriate document index as soon as practicable after mm -hmm. the recording date to give a little flexibility there. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm being honest and saying, you know, uh, I'm making best guess there from my perspective, yeah. and I think that's why we should talk about it here. As long as it gets done, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I just wanted to give some updates, something that I remember during the legislative procedure when uh, the treasurer, was it the treasurers were working with ISAC and they had that legislation that they, they had proposed, which is, it required that I think before a property was sold, they had to make sure they had paid all the mm -hmm. amounts that were required. One of the discussions that some of them were talking about was some way of synergy between recorders and um, the auditors and the assessors. So I think this opens up room to have that mm -hmm. conversation and see how this information can easily flow through or it's sent right away or whichever mechanism is there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I, I'm having to scroll through. Uh, and did you suggest a specific time frame. I see a reference, but I'm not sure I see. Okay, so uh, the idea of as soon as practicable, would that be sufficiently flexible um, rather than specifying a number of days? Um, and maybe I think that that, would, go ahead. I think that would be a better idea instead of a specific number of days. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I, with the understanding that uh, we would modify the language here um, uh, with regard to um, if there's a change in the postal identification number to say something like as soon as practicable. Um, and is the five-day limit okay for if it's an unchanged or should that, that be something different as well? Well, uh, Melissa, I'm, we'll get back to my question, but um, I don't think the recorders bear any liability for anything that's put on a document. Uh, that is the proposed responsibility. Everything I understand about how your business works, and um, and you know that's why there are certain liability protections in the code, uh, right, to to prevent that from happening. So um, I, I think that would be our position. And if there's something that we needed to do to reinforce that, um, well, um, again, I'm going to say that. Your, if, if a parcel number is not on a document, I'm going to go back to uh, uh, the, uh, the idea that um, you, know, you can't index what you don't know. And uh, the index is yours. It's not anybody, it's not anybody else's. So I, I, I wouldn't have any 
I'm not saying that I wouldn't ask that, you know, our friends at Brick Entry to, you know, consider that question, but I really don't perceive any liability on the part of the recorder. Well, I am asking if I'm, if uh, if a submitter puts a number on there, um, there is a presumption that they know what they're doing. I'm not saying they're going to be correct all the time. We know that doesn't happen. Uh, but if you receive information from another office holder that says, here is the parcel ID number uh, for this particular transaction, um, there, I think there's some good faith there on your part um, that would give you some protection. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm not even aware that any of you have been sued um, because of anything you put in your index. I'm not aware of a case of that. So, but we can check it out for sure. But I would feel confident enough that you're on solid ground to ask you to go ahead and approve a policy if you agree with it. So if so somebody, yes. This is Lisa, I'm gonna jump in. There were lots of questions in the chat. For everyone who presented a question, was your question addressed or answered? And I know you, I'm not pointing you out, Ann, but I know that you had several, Deb McDonald and Eagle Indexing, you don't have that area, but I wonder if it's a simple ad and you might be able to get that information from other people at Eagle. Well, <clears throat> one thing I would say uh, about that, about the, you know, the in, incapable service providers, uh, this is something that we'll raise with them uh, when we have a meeting tomorrow. You know, they they should have systems that allow for, if, the, if the, there's a transaction and there are multiple parcels involved, maybe their database, maybe it's an incorrect assumption that, there can only be one parcel ID associated with a particular document, which I would say that's probably an incorrect assumption if they're uh, doing it that way. That and would be neat in our county. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, the other the other is for those who are not able to, you know, because maybe you don't have the same service provider serving every office. So uh, I think somebody said earlier, you know, there'll have to be a plan B. Uh, yeah, uh, there needs to be some other way to communicate with the other office so that you're getting the information that you need. It doesn't have to be the most elegant thing like Lynn County has, um, but it, it can be a process that, uh, that you can set up. And I think to, from my point of view, one of the arguments for making this effective in January 25 instead of January 24 is that it gives ample notice to everybody uh, that hey, we're heading in this direction. Um, take take this opportunity to explore and have conversations with your service provider and your fellow office holders to see what kind of thing can be worked out. But you know, we know we know for sure, as Sue mentioned earlier, that it's pretty hard to build associations with other databases when you don't have a common data point. And everything I know about how things are done across the whole country is that the most accepted common data point is the postal identification number. That's um, true. Because it connects you to the GIS system. So uh, what are your wishes, subcommittee? Um, if somebody were to make a motion, um, I would uh, say it this way, that uh, to approve the proposed amendment relating to parcel identification numbers as presented, except that in section 3.1, subsection two, um, the language be modified uh, to require the addition of the information as soon as practicable instead of referring to a specific number of business days. That's, that's what I heard you guys say. Is that acceptable or what other amendments would you like to consider? 
I'm good with that. Can I second? <laughs> oh, Joan did. Good deal. <laughs> well, you, it has to be a member of the subcommittee. Technically, okay, so. sorry. Yep, gotcha. Okay, so, uh, yes, and I will try to repeat the motion. Um, um, the motion would be to approve the policy change as presented, except for a modification to 310 subsection 2. Uh, actually, let me bring that up so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. So what I have on screen is, so if you look at this whole section, 3.10 sub 2, that this whole underlying section would be changed so that uh, the time frame required would be as practicable, as soon as practicable, um, to, to allow for flexibility uh, for different counties, different systems or whatever. It's more important that it get done. I, I think that there are, um, there'd be some expectation of timeliness, right? Not two years from now, uh, but uh, at the same time to not be so specific in terms of number of days. Uh, that's what I understand the basic idea to be, that we would modify this. After the meeting, uh, we'll take a stab at um, circulating uh, some updated language and make sure that um, it is consistent with what you think. Nothing becomes official until the ESS committee uh, acts on it. So uh, we have time to work on it and we'll be sure to circulate that. Uh. Can I just make one more comment on this? Yes. You know, parcel numbers and your most of our service providers are, are nationwide. They have nationwide customers not just Iowa, and this isn't new. <laughs> and it's happening in other states, so tell them not to give you any pushback, to get busy and do it. <laughs> okay, so I've, I've repeated the motion, uh, and asked me to, to repeat that. Uh, is every, everybody on the same page and understand it now? Uh, I do have a motion from Ashton and a second from Joan. Any further discussion? Uh, if there's no further conversation, I say, first of all, thank you. And I would ask for a vote. All those in favor, say aye. Or, or type it in the chat pod. Aye. Thank you, Jolene, Naomi, Ashton, Jane, Deb, Joan. Okay. Uh, is there any opposition from a member of the subcommittee? If so, please say or enter an A in the chat pod. Associated reference doc. Like related okay. Doc. With no, hearing no opposition, we'll declare the motion approved. And let's move on to the next agenda item. Thank you so much. So um, the, the next thing I want to just mention, I'm not asking for any action. Um, we, we are running out of time. So I just want to mention that we are looking at some possible changes to section uh, six of the policies procedures relating to the so-called back the blue program. And this language can be found in section 6.8. And generally speaking, we have implemented what the legislature said they wanted. They may not have fully understood what they've adopted. Uh, and I, I think, you know, kind of the grapevine uh, discussion that I've heard about suggests that some of your fa fellow county office holders, county sheriffs, judges, and whatever, aren't necessarily very satisfied with the law as it was passed. Um, because it really doesn't do anything. It do the redaction as the law requires, but it do, do, really doesn't disguise or hide much information that uh, somebody could find if they really wanted to, to find it. So, and I, I would have to say generally that's true anyway, even if we were 
um, expunging the record from the Animal Land Records website entirely. That doesn't mean that that person can't be found. Um, that's kind of a false uh, sense of security. But at the same time, um, you know, there are some risks that at some point down the road, somebody's going to say, rightly or wrongly, you know, they didn't do what they expected us to do. They followed the letter of the law, but it doesn't really help me. And um, just as a sort of preemptive, okay, what can we do differently? Uh, we're looking at options that would allow us to withhold more information from the OWLR website, but do it in such a way that it doesn't interfere with the titling process in Iowa. And one general way you can do that is to um, provide special access to certain, certain people in certain roles under the law and so that the people that need to see it can see it or that permission to be granted by um, the uh, person to a specific another entity like a bank or a mortgage company or a title company. If they needed to see it and we had their permission, we could enable ways to allow that to happen without put, putting it all on the internet. I'm just making you aware that this discussion is taking place, um, both internally. We're also going to be having a meeting with uh, representatives of the Iowa Land Title Association to explore ideas. And we also have a meeting set up with the Bar Association uh, to discuss the same issue. So we do not have a specific proposal to present to you today. I'm doing my due diligence to inform you that this discussion is taking place. And if you have any comments about it, I would welcome them. Um, so that's the explanation. Are there, are there any comments that you might wish to share? In the chat pod or otherwise. Okay. Uh, then moving on, um, we had had an internal discussion with the uh, staff uh, about uh, whether or not we have uh, a properly configured a particular document type in e-submission and uh, <laughs> unable to resolve it within our own staff discussion, we just simply would have asked the standards committee what your opinion is. But since the beginning of e-submission, this document type has been set up this way. And one of the things that we allow is for uh, an affidavit non-transfer to possibly have an additional transaction where there might be a supplemental recording fee. And our question is, does this ever happen in your history of experience or should we modify this configuration to not allow an additional transaction? Simple question. We need your guidance. And I see that Sue and Joan are both entering a comment. Jane is entering a comment. It does happen here. All sorts of affidavits are recorded correcting multiple originals. Sue is not, are, are you saying goodbye? <laughs> Thank yes, you, I'm going to have to say goodbye. <laughs> okay, goodbye. All right. I'm waiting for the comments to be written in the chat pod. Sorry for the the pregnant pause there. Jane says, I can't think of an instance where there are additional transactions for an affidavit right now referencing more than one previously recorded document. 
but I would say a reference is not really an additional transaction. It's just a class reference, right? Thank you, Jane. It's okay to talk, everybody. <laughs> okay, uh, Joan said, we see affidavits correcting a mortgage assignment of rents and other documents. Joan says, same as Joan, it does happen here too. Okay, um, I thank everybody for your input. Um, some say I don't have, don't recall anything. Others say it happens all the time. Uh, and that tells me that we're not gonna make any change right now, that we're gonna leave it the way it is because some people apparently do use it. Um, but that may mean that we have uh, additional conversation going forward. Uh, but uh, thank you everybody. Um, and, uh, I, I appreciate your input. Okay, because we are uh, at uh, nine minutes left, we aren't going to get through everything, but I am going to ask your indulgence uh, and let me explain a few things. Um, so the first thing I have on screen um, is um, what you have previously approved. That is uh, a potential amendment to subsection one of 331-606-B, which I would just call uh, an update. You know, you're bringing it up to speed, you modify modified language, and uh, you acted on it previously to say, yeah, we're okay with this. Um, yep. Only relating to subsection one. Um, <laughs> this was taken to the ESS committee at their meeting in August, and they also approved it. Now, this does not mean that we're gonna present it right away to the legislature. Um, uh, because we're not done with the conversation, but just in terms of having the organization say, yes, this part is okay, and then we can move on and talk about other things. So um, not meaning that we can't revisit anything. <laughs> we can, uh, because nothing's been uh, totally adapted. We haven't, uh, we're not gonna be presenting legislation on this this year. I just want to assure everybody of that, okay? So then uh, the next thing that, and this was all a part of the homework we shared with you, is that we identified that um, there is a, a conflict in the law from our current practice. Current practice is that if somebody submits a document, even though they're prohibited by law from doing it, we still encourage you to record it because we take it through a redaction process, okay? Um, technically speaking, if you were following absolutely the letter of the law, it would be something that you decline. Um, however, uh, because we have this process, I would say, no, we shouldn't decline it because we have a way of dealing with it. And so we kind of need to correct the law to reflect what our current practice is, which is to add the language that says, however, a document which includes PII shall be recorded, provided that the document is subjected to a redaction process as specified in section 331-606A, subsection three. So from our point of view, um, this is just a legalizing act based on what we're currently doing. And I would ask you to consider that. Um, I'm gonna move on because I wanna get through each of these topics, even if we don't have time to really have a thorough discussion, we're gonna have to do that later. And my assurance to you is that all of this is open for discussion. We aren't forcing this uh, ahead, not asking you to take any action today but explaining it to you for, for the consideration. We sent the homework out that addresses all of these issues. I'm gonna say, generally speaking, we didn't get that much input. 
third, I think that would be a third thing to say. Um, but we did get some comments, and so um, went back to the drawing board and said, okay, let's take another run at this, but with the input that we did receive, what would we change? And that's what this represents. So this section is your new homework, okay? You can put the old homework away. This is the new assignment. So um, there are about five different things here. One is um, the, um, the idea of um, just clarifying um, that um, there is a reason why we are adapting um, uh, a new introduction. So as you go back and look at subsection one of 331-606B, it says, county recorders shall refuse if something doesn't meet all of the things that follow. And one suggestion we're making is, can we take a little bit more friendly approach to this from a customer point of view? Instead of saying, shall refuse to say, this is our purpose. We have document formatting standards. We're trying to do this because we're trying to create the best quality permanent unaltered archive of information on behalf of the citizens of Iowa. And we're saying if the former content of a document or incident prevents or inhibits the county recorder from performing this duty, the county recorder may decline to record a document or instrument. And the other idea represented here is that um, the standards really are focused on not legal requirements, but on the things that affect your ability to do recording. That is a mindset change. Uh, and that's why this alternative language is suggested. The next main topic, item two, is suggest kindly. Do we have to have the three inch margin? Are there other ways to do it that would be more friendly to the submitter and the preparer? And we have done this for surveyors. We've said we need a blank rectangular spot. And what we're saying here is the same thing as we say to surveyors. Have a blank rectangular spot at the top of the page so that there is room for the recording stand. That, that's what we're saying. I understand that some may say, well, what if it has to be re-recorded? I get that. Um, maybe that's what a cover page is for. Um, uh, so recognizing there may not be universal opinions on this, but this is the idea that we're presenting. Would it be acceptable generally to allow for a white area sufficient for a recording stamp in lieu of the full three inch margin at the top of the page? I'm going to open it up in here. I just want to get through all, all of them. The next one um, is a modification. Um, again, in subsection two, to say that um, I, I related to this um, um, indirectly, at least to the three, three inch margin, is to focus on uh, that is presented for recording a document shall contain the following information necessary for a county recorder to archive and index the document or instrument. And the idea behind that is um, basically to focus on, is it recordable? Then subsection four, which is a little bit more involved, um, reorders and modifies the listing of things that have to be included in an instrument. And the reordering is primarily driven by the enumerated items. What does the recorder need to do their job to be indexed? Well, your index needs to include the title, the document type, the grantor and grantee names. Um, um, I'm not changing anything about the uh, name of the taxpayer, although it feels redundant to me. Um, but okay, if the taxpayer's name has to be there, fine, that should be included. The post location information as applicable, including the quarter section, section, township range, 
or lot box, subdivision name, and city town if platted. So in other words, we're saying we want you as a submitter, if it is applicable, to provide us with um, the um, information we need to do our indexing, and this is the legal information that we need. You may still need to provide the legal description in the document for legal purposes, but this is what we need as recorders. And uh, similar to the current law, allowance for you to the submitter to include a page reference where other information can be found. Uh, the instrument date, um, and then lastly, the recording reference number of an associated recorded document or instrument as specified by the county land record information system, which in part you did earlier today, or for other statutory requirements, if possible. And then uh, uh, there is a, um, a requirement in the current code that says that you have to include um, any address that's required by statute. You know, indexed by statute, so it's not in the enumerated list of indexable things, but we're still saying, hey, we're not repealing that from the law. If it's, if it's required by statute, yeah, we need that too. Um, then instead of in, including the, um, the references to the preparer um, uh, in the main section, we've got a subsection that says, because you don't index this, right? Um, it, it should include the name, mailing address, and phone number of the person who prepared the document or instrument, but we've added in or the person best able to address any issue affecting the recordability of the document or instrument. If a document or instrument is presented in electronic form, the information may be submitted as metadata, which accompanies the document or instrument. I'm acknowledging right now that I know some people have said that the standard should be the same for the electronic documents and physical documents I'm not agreeing with you on that. I think an electronic document is a different thing. And you already said so in subsection one, uh, if you go back and look at the details. We did add in the idea there of treating something differently if it's a physical versus an electronic document. I understand that not everybody may not love that, but I'm here to present an idea. Um, and just to conclude that section by saying that the information in this section is for the purpose of providing information necessary for recording. And we're saying document information necessary to execute a transaction or to have legal effect shall be included in a document as determined by the preparer in accordance with legal standards. The idea here is, let's put it right in writing, black and white. Not the recorder's job to evaluate the legality of a document. That is the responsibility of the preparer or the people who participate in executing the document. I know not everybody agrees with that either, but um, kind of I've heard some people say recorders record, um, and this is just affirm, affirming that. And then um, the last section here uh, really gets to the whole idea uh, would you be open to permitting a submitter to prepare an index legend and submit that as a part of the document as a part of maybe a cover sheet or maybe as a part of the first page of the document? You have found it acceptable for surveys and plats. Has that worked for you? And what if we did the same thing in uh, a regular document? encourage preparers to put the information you need to do your job in a concise area so that it is easy to understand. And then we're also basically saying, you got three options. You include it on the first page of the document, you include a cover sheet, here are the requirements for that, or you can provide an index legend. You get to, uh, you get to choose. Um, the last thing, I'll mention just to call out is that 
in this proposal, this draft, we are clearly stating that attestation statements should not be included in a cover sheet. Um, from what we understand, a cover sheet is really not part of the legal instrument. It is an artifact associated with the recording process. And therefore, things that have legal effect need to be in the document itself, not on a cover sheet. Okay, those are the concepts that we presented to you. And I'm going to just say, generally speaking, with all the time that you've had the homework, nobody has really said, no, no, no. Uh, I, I want you to talk about it. Um, we don't have time to do it today. I just need to thank you for just letting me present it to you uh, as a question. And then we look forward to having further conversations uh, about it in uh, future meetings. Um, we need to adjourn because we're already really over time. But if anybody has any comments or you want to virtually throw tomatoes at me, uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, this will be the time before we have to go. Ashton is writing a virtual tomato throw. Uh, she said, I wish I could send a meme. <laughs> Very good. All right. Uh, we'll bring this to a close, but I do welcome your comments. I'm presenting this to you as a new version of homework. We want to have your input. My parting shot is this, that there is a potential for a proposal to be developed that would present be presented to the stakeholders and the legislature to say, we need you to do something about fees. And I'm just taking the position that the chances of success for that are greater if we can figure out some combination of things that to go with that, that would say, we're working to be better. We're working to make your life better. Help us with the fee and we can get all these things done. That's really the underlying mindset in the back of my mind. Not just to mess with you or make your life difficult, but just to think about how does that narrative unfold? So give that some thought. Everybody have a great, happy Halloween. And uh, we'll be sharing some comments with the uh, full uh, uh, ESS committee at their November meeting. Whatever you share with me between now and then, I will share with them. So send me your comments. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.